Have you ever been walking around the town where you live and seen a house that tugs at your heart a little bit? Close your eyes. Think back on your strolls, your walks, your bike rides, your runs, and raise your hand if something comes to mind. Now open your eyes. Have you put your hands down? <laughs> In Savannah, we have lots of these houses. Maybe it used to be a grand old home. Perhaps it was a proud little house. Maybe it was lovely at one time, and now it's boarded up, and its windows are a little sad. Perhaps weeds or vines are starting to take over, especially in this climate. And maybe this is a house you see as you go about your usual business, and then you round the corner and think, man, if I had the money, I would love to buy that place and fix it up. And this is something that I've thought about my whole life because I've lived a lot of different places. And I also love histories and homes and stories. And I've always thought, why is that closed? What happened? In Savannah, we have so many of these houses that last year I found myself entertaining this fantasy a little bit more seriously when my boyfriend thought we should buy a house and fix it up. And truth be told, I didn't think this was going to happen, so I said, sure, honey. <laughs> Let's go look. So we started looking in Savannah because we live here. And we knew we wanted to be in the neighborhood that we already live. This is a neighborhood that is bounded by Henry and Anderson to the north, Victory to the south, Bull to the east, and Montgomery to the west. And this is a neighborhood that is rich with history. We live two doors down from Meldrum Row already, if you're familiar with the history of that area, which I won't go into here. But it's a wonderful area. We live where the star is, and we started looking block by block in the area that's covered by the circle. This is the southwestern-ish, downtown-ish corner of Savannah, if you're not from here. And there were lots of opportunities, even on our own block. This is down the street from us, down the street from us. And this is a house that I think of, this sweet pair of cottages, when I think of a house that's melancholy but full of promise. This is down the street from us, down the street from us, on the block behind us. And the trick was to find one that was just dilapidated enough that we thought the owner might want to sell it for what we were willing to pay. <laughs> Savannah has so many of these houses. Uh, this one is for sale now. You could buy it. Uh, the inside is Swiss chalet meets Victorian dollhouse. <laughs> and at the time, it was boarded up, and they had to unscrew the plywood off the front door and let us in. And these houses that need love are right next door to the houses that are full of love and have patio lights and people sitting on the front porches. It's really house by house by house, not block by block in this town. And then we found ours. <laughs> but I knew this was the house for us as soon as we walked in. It had a lovely... Hepto bismol pink hallway that had been blocked off when they duplexed it many years ago. It had scavenged fireplaces. It had holes in the floor where the tubs were, and weird vinyl on the walls. It even had an abandoned piano and a fire upstairs. <laughs> this was a total rehab. And it wasn't just a project of ownership, this was a project of stewardship. And stewardship is about knowing that you are not the first to be in a place and you're not the last. You're there to take care of it so that it can continue on and that other people can continue to enjoy it. You are part of sustaining a life cycle. Whether it's a house or a place where you live or something that you're part of that's an initiative, that's stewardship. And this was no more evident than when we found the diploma of the owner sitting in the closet where it had been for the last 20 years. Kyer Ellison was a native Savannian. He graduated from Beach High School, and then he taught math there for his entire career. He died three days after selling us this house. He'd bought it when he was a younger man for his mother and some of his siblings, and his children spent a lot of time there with his, grand, with his mother and with their grandmother. This was a really important place in their lives. And when we offered to sell the house, which we now call the Edna Ellison House, in his honor and her honor, they asked to come to where we live and sat in our rentry way and asked us who we were, what we did for a living. And what he was really asking us was, who were we to buy his family home? 
And this was the beginning of how social, economic, and racial disparity began to play a significant role in my experience with the Edna House. And something I didn't know would be a big part of my experience. What he was really asking was what were we going to do with something that was so important to him. I grew up in upper middle class suburbia, and I've lived in upper middle class urban environments until I moved to 33rd and Montgomery Street. So this was new for me. And the move to 33rd and Montgomery was a stretch, but it's ultimately, be, ultimately been a good one. The Ellisons cared about this place because they'd had birthday th birthdays there. Their parents had grown old, their children had grown up. This was an emotional touchstone, not just a significant property that contributed to the historic fabric of the block because it was unlike any other house in Savannah. This was theirs. And that's why it took them five months to agree to sell it to us. But then they did. <laughs> this was such an exciting project. I have a background in history and anthropology and sociology and anthropology, which led to my work in historic preservation and public policy. Um, and so I carry with me a sense of place and a desire to contribute to my community. And then I found design, what I do now. Design is an approach to the world. Design strategy is about asking the right kinds of questions. And what we do is look at the positive and negative spaces, much like artists do. And we do this to find gaps so that we can ask questions like, how might we, what if we, which lead to insights and opportunities and hopefully action. And this became the framework from which I could understand some unexpected emotional consequences of dealing with the house. The first of these significant experiences began in, well, we got the house in October, and then the significant experience began in January. It had been empty for a little while. The activity around bringing contractors through had died down. My boyfriend had deployed, and I'd been out of town. So when I came back after the holidays, I noticed that there was a lot more trash, styrofoam, food clamshells, cigarette butts, condom wrappers, even kitty litter in the driveway, and someone had had a viewing party for New Year's Eve in the back with an abandoned couch. But more importantly, I noticed that someone had also taken up residence, again, on the back porch and underneath the house. The first time I was there and realized this, the person wasn't there. So I started by contacting a homelessness advocate who came and left a note for the person, but that was really all he could do. And I kept going back during the day, earlier in the mornings, and eventually found myself standing in front of a man who was asleep, asking him to pack up his belongings in the wintertime and leave a place to which he was doing no harm and nobody was using. What would you say? I really had to justify this to myself. There are real reasons why I ought to ask someone to leave and why a property ought to remain empty while it's awaiting construction. A few blocks away, a house had been purchased a couple years ago, and then in winter time, it was cold. People were around. Some homeless people were in the back of the house, and they lit a fire, and it caught onto the house. And luckily, no one was hurt. But I was afraid that something like this with a more tragic outcome might happen to our house before we had the chance to fix it. The situation escalated. I found myself asking him again. Our contractor asked him to leave. I filed charges with the police so that there would be paperwork on file and they would be able to ask him to leave legally. Um, then I called the police while he was still there, and he was still there. On the day that we started the final cleanup, and his belongings and perhaps others were removed from the house and put out onto the curb next to all the trash. Something that I'm still not sure how I feel about is the privilege that we have of fixing up a property like this with the fact that we took away someone's shelter, even if it wasn't his by right. So to deal with this, there are two things that I go back to. One has been my experience on 33rd Street, and the other has been a pretty significant study that was done in 2010. So this is on the corner of where I live, and this is across the street from me. Two of these houses are owned by a woman named Marie. She's a house painter and a handy woman. She only has two fingers on one of her hands. She also has a PhD in human anatomy. Next door, we have Miss Ruth. She runs charity missions for her church. On the corner, a newly engaged lesbian couple live. Down the block, Luann and Angel, 
They recently rehabbed a house because they felt called to after their daughter started attending SCAD. We also have Brandy and John, who homeschool their two young boys, and Carolyn, who moved into her house 60 years ago when she was six years old, and her family was the first African-American family on the block. This is not what people usually know or insinuate when they ask me about how I like my neighborhood. I like it fine. So the takeaway here for me was understanding really what's happening on a block, not what you think might be happening on a block. The second thing I'd like to talk about is a study called The Soul of the Community, studied by the Knight Foundation. They looked at 26 different communities and 43,000 people. And the main question that they had was, why do people love where they live? Not an easy thing to distill into a few answers, but they did find some commonalities. People love where they live because of the aesthetics, because of the social offerings, and because of the openness of a place. And I don't mean the physical openness, I mean the social openness. How open are you to your neighbors, to your friends, to the people you don't know, to the people who pass through your neighborhood? Savannah, if you think about it, has a lot of these locked down. We are easily one of the most beautiful places that anyone could live in the United States, possibly the world. <coughs> we have wonderful open spaces. We have places that people can convene. We have engaging activities, and we have art that speaks to people and our place. And we have more and more of this all the time. And all of these very positive things are part of something called placemaking. And placemaking is also linked to economic vitality. There are also a few things in the framework of placemaking that are particularly important. And these are two that I thought about in particular when thinking about our house and what we were doing on 41st Street. The first is that place optimism matters. So to think that as you drive by Montgomery or perhaps Jefferson Street or the equivalent in your own community, and you think that this community has nothing to offer or this block has nothing to offer, that won't get you anywhere and it doesn't do anything for your fellow citizens because they are impacted by your optimism. And the second is that place is so powerful, it is equalizing and it mobilizes people through activity. And activity begets different kinds of mobilization, social, financial. This piece of graffiti was downtown Savannah in 2011, since gone, it was on Broughton Street. And at first I thought it was a little presumptuous to say, I dream big for those who can't. But the fact is, if we have the privilege, we have the responsibility to do that. 41st Street in the Edna House is our version of dreaming big. And we're very lucky to have been able to do so. So as you go back into your lives, your communities, your blocks, or the blocks that you walk past, think of a few things. Be open. Really understand what's happening there before passing judgment or repeating what other people have said about that place. Be optimistic. There is no more powerful or better change than that, that which you bring to your own community. And lastly, dream big. Thank you.